Welcome, cool cats and kittens. Here we are back with another awesome physics theory lesson. Um, today we're going to talk about refraction. Um, big ideas through the EMR unit, one of the big ideas, is the dual nature of light, where light most definitely sometimes behaves exclusively like a wave and cannot be explained by the particle model of light, which we'll learn about later. And there are other aspects of light where you can only explain it if you imagine it as a bunch of particles or made up of a bunch of bundles of energy that have particle-like properties. Um, that's But that's later in chapter 14. So today um, we're going to learn specifically about a uniquely wave behavior of light. This is where light behaves like a wave. Particles do not undergo refraction. Only waves do. So it is unique to the wave nature of light. So here we go. Refraction. Light rays are partially reflected and partially refracted when they pass from one medium to another. So I really like that picture right there where it's got a picture of an oar um, dipping into the surface of a clear pond. So you can clearly see the light reflecting from the surface of the um, water and that you can see the reflection of the oar. Um, you can also see the light that passes through down into the water and then obviously back off the oar and back out into the air so you can see it. You can see the, the oar under the water. You see that the oar looks like it is bent. Um, it is in fact definitely not bent, but it is the light that is bent. So that is the refraction. It's the change in direction or bending of waves as they pass from the air into the water, off the oar, and then back out into the water, from the water into the air. When it passes from the air water at a boundary, it refracts, it bends, bounces off the oar, comes back out and goes from the water into the air, that same boundary, it bends again, this time in a different direction, which we'll get to. And in that bending, it looks like the oar is in fact crooked, which obviously it is not. This change in direction of a wave as it passes from one medium to another is called refraction. Again, it's caused by a change in speed. Okay, so here's an analogy, a couple of analogies for um, explaining or visualizing how refraction occurs. So imagine you've, you've got a bunch of a column of troops match, marching from a fast medium to a slow medium. So they're moving from a concrete surface where they can march really fast to a swamp where they obviously have to slow down because let's say the mud is up to their thighs or something like that. So they have to move much slower. So imagine like, let's say like these soldiers, they've been they've been you know away for a really long time and they're really lonely and they're they're holding hands as they as they march from the concrete to the swamp. So imagine like, I don't know if you can see this, but you're marching like this from concrete to a swamp and you're holding hands with the person beside you like that. And imagine the person, the people to the right of you over here, they slow down while well, the people to the left of you are moving at a higher speed. So if the person on the right slows down and the people are left are moving at a higher speed, you're going to end up turning or changing direction as you pass from the concrete to the swamp. Same thing for the toy car there with the um, moving from a fast medium, let's say hardwood or whatever, um, uh, onto a carpet where it slows down. So you've got two wheels, let's say they roll independently as the um, car passes from the hardwood to the carpet right here. Uh, the wheel that is on the right is going to hit the carpet before the wheel that is on the left here. So what will happen is the right hand side of the car is going to slow down before the left hand side and that's going to result in that change in direction. So the, the car has refracted. Again, this is just an analogy. Um, waves do this same thing. Obviously, they're, they're not like soldiers and cars, but 
it helps us visualize why that occurs. Why do you have a change in direction because of a change in speed? Okay, the extent to which a light ray bends depends on what we call the refractive index, symbolized by lowercase n, of the medium, or we just say index of refraction. The more optically dense a medium, the slower that light travels through it. So, uh, for example, light is just in mean, any transparent media, like you have air, obviously, and you've got uh, water or glass or diamond. Diamond is very, very, very dense material. So light, when it passes from air into diamond, will slow down a lot more than if it just passes from air into water, for example. And we quantify that amount of bending by the index of refraction. So imagine the greater the change in speed, the greater amount, the greater amount of refraction, because we go back to our soldiers here. If these guys enter like a medium where they really, really, really have to slow down a lot, like really, really deep mud, that line is going to change direction more drastically than if they just go from a concrete to like, I don't know, tall grass or something like that. Well, then they have to slow down a little bit. So you're only going to have a little bit of a change in direction. Oops, wrong way. All right. So when light travels from a medium with a low refractive index, so here we've got air. Oh, and by the way, I should note that this table is from your textbook on page 667. And when you're doing homework questions, um, it will give you various, you know, course class, grass, ugh, glass, crown glass, whatever, ruby, diamond. It'll refer to these transparent mediums in uh, or media in word problems. You have to go look up those um, indices of refraction on page 667. And one thing else I should point out too as well, we notice that the index of refraction of a vacuum is set to be 1.00 because that's the medium in which light travels the fastest is the least dense medium obviously there's no particles notice air has an index refraction of 1.0003 so only slightly more optically dense as a matter of fact on your data sheet on the back under constants it's got the index refraction of air equal to the index refraction of a vacuum to two decimal places they're both 1.00. It's such a small difference that it doesn't come until the fourth decimal place. Okay, so going from air, for example, into water. So here I've got a couple of arrows and I just drew them in uh, where the light is going through and it's passing through the air-water interface. It's going to slow down and bend toward the normal line. Here, the angle between the ray and the normal line, you call that the angle of incidence. And what's going to happen is it's not going to go straight here. I got it starting off straight. It's going to actually slow down and bend toward the normal line like that. So the angle of incidence is greater than the angle of refraction. So when you go from low refractive index like air to a high refractive index like water, it's going to slow down, bend toward the normal line. So that's like the the, the um, light passing through, uh, like the ore example that I had at the beginning, that beginning picture. Um, some of that light passes first through the air into the water, slows down and bends toward the normal. Then when that light hits the ore, it's going to bounce off the ore and then come back out. So when it's coming back out, it's going to speed up again, and it's now going to bend away from the normal line, kind of like that. So the angle of refraction between the ray and the normal line is greater than the angle, angle of um, incidence between the ray, again, and the normal line. Okay, S Snell's law. Snell's law is the formula which we're gonna work with today, or one of the formulas, to quantify the amount of how the, the wave changes in terms of direction change caused by a speed change and also a change in wavelength because if a wave slows down it's going to have it, those wave fronts are going to have a tendency to sort of bunch up so we learned about wave behaviors in physics 20 where the frequency of a wave depends on the frequency of vibration of the source of the wave so if you have 
I don't know, a vibrating source of sound or something like that, or your hand is vibrating back and forth and you're holding a slinky. If you vibrate your hand back and forth uh, twice a second, you're going to have the wave propagate uh, that propagates on the slinky vibrating twice a second or two hertz. Okay, so frequency of a wave depends on the frequency of vibration of the source of the wave. So we've got red light here as an example. So red light would be the long wavelength of light in terms of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum there, the visible spectrum. So what happens is I've drawn in um, the rays to represent the direction of the light. So notice hits the boundary and the, the normal line, it's not drawn in this diagram, but it would be um, perpendicular to the surface and notice it slows down and bends away from the, or bends toward the normal line. Okay, so when waves enter a new medium, there is no change in frequency. The source vibrates at the same frequency no matter what. When the light travels from the air into the water, this source vibration does not change. The frequency does not change. So that means the frequency of the wave does not change as it goes from one medium to another. So the frequency does not change. However, the speed changes and also the wavelength changes as well. So considering light as a transverse wave, according to Maxwell's model that you learned about in the first part of the chapter there, it for sure obeys the universal wave equation. Speed equals frequency times wavelength. So if frequency is constant as light goes from one medium to another medium, uh, we can write this proportionality statement. The speed is proportional to the wavelength. So if the speed goes down, the wavelength shrinks. If the speed increases, if it goes from the water into the air, then the wavelength increases by the same amount. So if the speed decreases by 20%, the wavelength gets 20% shorter, etc. So here we've got a bunch of ratios, four of them. Um, one thing I want you to notice is that three of them are the same. So in terms of the same, it's in terms of one over two, one over two, and one over two for the ratio that represents the change in direction, that is the angle of incidence, angle of refraction. The other one represents the change in speed, speed in medium one, speed in medium two, and then the wavelength in medium one, wavelength in medium two. So direction change, speed change, and wavelength change, they're all the same. And then the one that is the reciprocal of the other three is the ratio for the indices of refraction. So this is one over two, one over two, one over two, and this one is the reciprocal of the other three. It is two over one. Red light with a wavelength of 640 nanometers enters a block of quartz glass that has an index of refraction of 1.47. Determine the wavelength and the speed of light in the glass. Okay, so we are going to assume that the light comes from the air, and the index of refraction of air, we'll just call it Na from our data sheet, is 1.00. And the speed of light in air as well, we also know that from our data sheet. 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So these are uh, oops, on your data sheet. All right, so you, first we're going to find out the wavelength of light in the glass. So wavelength of light in the glass, I'm going to put that in the numerator of a little ratio divided by the index, ref or sorry, the wavelength in the air, it, it doesn't really matter. You, you don't have to put G on top and A on the bottom, or A on top and G on the bottom, because as long as you remember that uh, for those ratios, all the ratios are the same, the one for change in direction, the one for change in speed, and the one for change in wavelength are all the same, except the index of refraction one is the reciprocal of the other three. So if we go G over A, then for the index of refraction, it's A over G. So then it's a simple matter to solve for lambda, or lambda G. So the index of refraction of air, 1.00. Wavelength on the air, 640 nanometers. 
Index of refraction of the glass is 1.47. So the wavelength in the glass is 435 nanometers. Okay. Next, we're to determine the speed of light in the glass. So very similar type of calculation. Speed of light in glass divided by speed of light in air is equal to the reciprocal ratio for the indices of refraction. So you solve for speed of light in the glass. 1.00 speed of light in air, again from our data sheet. And index refraction of the glass, whoops, it is 1.47. So the speed of light in the glass works out to be 2.04 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Total internal reflection. Total internal reflection is reflection of all the incident light back into a medium of high refractive index due to the inability to refract light beyond the maximum angle of 90 degrees. So uh, that sentence without some context is kind of, what do you mean beyond the maximum angle of 90 degrees? So this, this diagram here is from your textbook, um, illustrates that. So here we've got a light source, so a lamp at the bottom of a swing pool or something like that. And let's say you've got light shining up towards the surface. So here's the water, there's the air, and maybe you're outside looking at the light uh, in the pool. If the angle of incidence is zero degrees, in other words, the rays pass directly at the boundary, um, all of the waves are going to slow down at once. So it's like the soldier analogy. Every column is going to slow down at the same time. So there's not going to be a change in direction. However, if you get an angle of incidence greater than zero degrees, and here we have increasing angles of incidence, we've got 20 degrees, 30 degrees, 45 degrees, and then Something happens here where there's this total internal reflection we'll get to. Um, it bounces off the interface. So getting back to our increasing angle of incidence, we notice that our first angle of 20 degrees, okay, well, speeds up and bends of the wave from the normal. Bends angle of refraction is 20 degrees, or 27, I mean. And then if we go to an increasing angle of incidence, we get an in increasing angle of refraction. So we're gradually increasing our angle of incidence and our angle of refraction also increases from 27 to 42, 45 angle of incidence, and it speeds up and bends away from the normal. We have 70. There is an angle, which I'll picture on the next page. I'm kind of actually sad that this diagram doesn't include it, where that angle of refraction, that refracted ray keeps on bending and bending and bending and bending toward the surface, and then eventually, it will increase to such an extent that the angle of refraction is actually 90 degrees. That ray, that refracted ray, bends away from the normal and ends up running parallel to the surface. Um, beyond that maximum angle, which is called the critical angle, if you go beyond that where the, uh, the refracted ray, the angle of refraction is sort of greater than 90 degrees, then none of the light will pass from, in this case, the water to the air. It will actually all bounce off the interface between the water and the air, and uh, it will obey the law of reflection, as you guys learned about when you talked about mirrors. So getting back to that, that's that critical angle that I just referred to. That angle of incidence is equal to a critical angle where, so let's say we had this, this is what we were doing uh, on the diagram before. So let's say we had, I don't know, here's a straight line, so it's gonna bend away from the normal. We increase the angle of incidence, it's gonna bend away from the normal a little bit more. Eventually you keep on increasing this angle of incidence, eventually you'll get to a point where this ray, whoops, this ray bends so far that the angle of refraction is 90 degrees. So at that point, we say that angle of incidence is called the critical angle. The angle of refraction is 90 degrees. 
Optical fibers make use of total internal reflection of light to transmit signals with virtually no energy loss and many advantages over electrical transmission. There's also a link for a YouTube video on um, fiber optics as an example of an application of total internal reflection. Determine the critical angle for a diamond air interface given that the index of refraction for diamond is 2.42. So if you're asked to find the critical angle, you always have to remember you have to go from medium of high index of refraction to low. So from high to low. So in other words, we're going from the diamond to the air because the ray has to bend away from the normal because it speeds up. So we're going to find out the critical angle is the angle inside the diamond. Probably my dog. My kids are playing with them. That's cool. <laughs> sine theta d over sine theta a. N a divided by n d. Okay, so you're asked to find out what is the critical angle. So that's the Critical angle theta critical is the index refraction in the diamond when the index or the angle of refraction, sorry, the angle of refraction in the diamond when the angle in the air is 90 degrees. So sine theta d and a times sine theta a divided by n d. So, to find the angle, inverse sine of 1.00 times the sine of 90 degrees, which if you remember from a unit circle for math, it's equal to 1, divided by the index refraction of the diamond. And you end up getting 24.4 degrees. One more application of refraction, prisms. And splitting up of white light into a rainbow, that is called dispersion. Separation of white light into its components, called dispersion, like it says there. So, this is a thing. This has been observed. The lower the wavelength of light, the more it refracts. So remember our range of visible spectrum from Roy G. Biv, we're going from red light, which is the uh, longest wavelength of light, right up at 700 nanometers, all the way down to 400 nanometers for violet light. So red is the longest wavelength of light, and violet is the lowest wavelength of light. So the index of refraction for red light, in terms of the amount that it bends, is less than the index of refraction of violet light. And since the visible spectrum is a range of wavelengths, then you've got a, a range of amount that each component of that light bends, and that spreads it out into a rainbow that you're familiar with. Another link to a couple YouTube videos actually about prisms and how that works. Okay, so that's the end of the first part of the section. The last part of the section, um, we're gonna get into thin lenses. It's going to go relatively quickly because you guys learned about um, mirrors and refraction. Reflection. We're going to talk about lenses and it's going to be instead of reflection we're going to talk about refraction. But for now practicing some Snell's Law stuff there's a part of the section that you guys should be doing. Okay, lenses. Now just like mirrors you had a converging mirror and a diverging mirror. Same thing with lenses. 
you have a converging lens. A converging lens, and again, I'm going to the way that Mr. Zadunich, we treated these ray diagrams is that we're not gonna do the ray diagrams um, in this part of the course. And I'm, when I show you one, I'm just gonna sort of point to one in terms of it adds context to what I mean in terms of, you know, bend towards the focal point and go away from the focal point. A lot of stuff you learn about in terms of all the terms real and um, virtual and, um, you know, diminished and all that kind of stuff you learned about for the mirrors, it's going to be the same thing for lenses. Instead of talking about reflection, we're going to talk about refraction. So you have a converging lens. Converging lens is a convex lens. It's sort of fatter around the middle that refracts rays that are parallel to the principal axis through a real principal focal point. So it's going to produce mostly a real image just like a converging lens. You guys learned about like a satellite dish is a converging, I mean, satellite dish is like a converging mirror. Converging lens, same thing, except now we're talking about refraction, obviously. For a diverging lens, it is a concave lens that refracts rays that are parallel to the principal axis, so they diverge away from each other. And if they, we draw those virtual rays that we just touched on a little bit last time, if you line up all these rays and you extrapolate them back in a straight line, they're all going to meet at this point right here. So it kind of looks like they're coming from that point. However, they're most certainly not because they just this ray just travels from here and then bends that way. So there is no ray here. That's what we call those virtual rays. Again, we're not going to get bogged down in these ray diagrams. Light will actually bend twice as it passes through the lens because refraction occurs when a ray passes through a boundary from one medium to another. So it bends once as it goes from the air to the glass, travels through a straight line, uh, travels in a straight line through the glass, and then when it goes from the glass back out into the air, speeds up again, bends away from the normal, and you get so two bending. Here you get slowing down, bending toward the normal, and then speeding up, bending away from the normal. So that's what that looks like. Again, gonna briefly go over this. Mr. Zunich probably just flashed up a couple of these diagrams where we're not gonna worry about these rays, one, two, and three, and being asked how to draw them. But um, here we've got an object forming a real image that is inverted or upside down. Here we've got a diverging lens. And again, don't get caught up in the details of these ray diagrams, but notice these refracted rays, the blue one, the green one, and the red one here, they're all spreading apart. So they will, they will not meet, they'll never meet because they're getting further away from each other. So it's not gonna form a real image, it's only gonna form a virtual image, sort of that's behind the lens, so to speak. Well, depends if you're talking about behind or in front, but you know what I mean. Okay, so you will note that I'm going to go over this relatively quickly because you've been over this stuff before, where the equations for mirrors, 1 over F equals 1 over DO plus 1 over DI, and those magnification ratios there, you learned about them for mirrors. So the sign conventions are the same. The values there, focal length, DO, DI, this is the object from the lens, this is the image from the lens, they're all the same as they were for mirrors, except now instead of reflection, we're talking about refraction. Again, that negative sign in the um, ratios for equating size of the image over size of the object or height um, to distance of the image from this lens divided by distance of the object from the lens, there is that negative sign in there. It's inserted to account for the sign conventions for mirrors, which we'll go over lastly. We remember that a, an erect image or a right side up image has a positive magnification and an inverted image or upside down image is a negative magnification. These sign conventions are the same as the ones to, that you guys use for uh, mirrors. Sign convents, conventions for use for the, instead of mirror equation, now it's called the lens equation. So real images, 
positive DI, virtual image, negative DI. If it's right side up, that means HI is positive, the height of the image is positive, it's upside down uh, or inverted, you've got a negative height. If you've got a converging lens, it is a real focal point and the focal length is positive. If you've got a diverging lens, so it spreads apart, the focal length is focal, focal point is virtual and the focal length is assigned a negative sign in that case. And as we remember from mirrors, all real images are inverted. So if DI is positive, then HI is negative. And all virtual images, negative DI, are erect or right side up. So if DI is negative, then HI for sure is positive. All right, so that is it for this section on refraction. There are a few questions for you guys to work on, and that's it. See you guys next time.